This is Dolan TV, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome back to another edition of Edmonton Oilers discussion here on the channel this fine Tuesday afternoon. Coffee's in, we're good to go, we're ready to rip some Edmonton Oilers discussion today. And how about I uh, spent the past 10-15 minutes going over and trying to reread and read and understand that Mark Spector article that came out on sportsnet.ca today. You may be familiar with it, yeah. If I say that Mark Spector article, some of you might get where I'm going. That actually came out yesterday, pardon me, came out at 2.59 p.m. yesterday, but I wanted to sink my teeth into some other stuff yesterday. However, Mark Spector, I'm going out and talking about it today and really, uh, really getting Oilers fans riled up by the looks of it on Twitter. And I just wanted to give you basically my take on the situation here, and especially out of this article, which is called Cahoon Signing Gives Oilers Opportunity to Maximize Dry Settle McDavid. Thing is, um, the first pretty much part of this article is just taking pot shots at the Oilers for failing in the play-in round, I'd say is what it is. So you look at it, um, one of the lines here in his article is it, it is easy to forget however that the Oilers lost in four games in their qualifying round series to the 12th place Chicago Blackhawks a team that was dispensed of quickly in round one by the Vegas Golden Knights I I really don't think it's easy to forget I'm sorry for a lot of a lot of people that I deal with day to day and a lot of people that come into the Dolany TV comment section or chirp me on Twitter or get at me on Twitter whatever terms you want to use to say somebody that sends me something on Twitter I don't think anyone's easily forgotten about the Chicago situation and what that happened and quite honestly this this article is a little bit of a mess to start when you subject talking about Cahoon signing gives Oilers time to maximize McDavid and dry settle and you go on a tangent about adding Cahoon, Pugliarvi, Barry and Turris and how this does nothing for adding defense to the Oilers team right right away. This is like the first five or six paragraphs of this article. It's all about sitting here. How is this team better equipped to win a playoff game tied 2-2 after 20, 40 minutes next season than it was last season? Where, where in this does this have anything to do with maximizing McDavid or Drysaddle? That was my thing, and he, I guess he was interviewing Holland for it. He called up Ken Holland and asked him about it, and Ken Holland pretty much told him, well, it's easier to defend in the NHL or easier to teach defense than it is to teach goal scoring. So we brought in goal scorers that you can teach to defend. And I mean, everybody notes that these guys might not be great defense guys, but they are capable of playing offense to the extent that their defense will make up for whatever other deficiencies they have in their game. And that's what we're getting excited for as Oilers fans. And then you have this just, oh my goodness, you want to talk about riling up Oilers fans. I don't know. If you haven't had time to read this article, go go get it going. The Toronto Maple Leafs have become the poster child for that good offense, heavy regular season. This clip right from the article written by Mark Spector. That can adjust to the objectively different style of hockey played in the NHL playoffs. Is Edmonton becoming that team, adding only Barry to their blue line and failing to improve on an iffy tandem in net? Like, are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, you can read the rest of it. As Holland said, that is a fair question, but at Rome, as they say, wasn't built in a day. Are you you got to be kidding me here. Yes, the iffy part of the, about the tandem is Mike Smith. We all get that. That is no news to us, and the Oilers' defense is iffy. But we saw at times last year, it's straight up. It's an easy formula. There's no iffiness about it. If the Oilers commit to playing hockey on a defensive side of things, if they commit to playing good defensive hockey in their own zone late in games, they can close out games no problem. The problem is you can't win a game, no matter what kind of good defense you play in a 2-2 hockey game in the playoffs, I don't care what we are rolling out there for forward lines or defense or what's in net, you can't win a game simply just by defending. I'm sorry. And that is what is just so mind-numbing about reading this article is, oh, we added all these offensive talents, but who's going to defend? If it's tied 2-2 and uh, going into the third period, you got to defend. you got to defend. No, ladies and gentlemen, you got to score as many goals as humanly possible so the other team can't score more than you and win. Yes, you got to defend. No crap, you got to defend. If you don't have the puck, you got to play defense. That's how hockey works. You, just, you don't just all go sit on the bench and let the other team have it in your own zone. Duh. Right, and this this is what it's just so mind numbing. I mean, I'm getting fired up about a Mark Spector article, and I think the consensus in Oilers land on Twitter based on it would be why am I wasting my time? But 
simply this is just mind-numbing that the Oilers go out of their way to improve so vastly. Ken Holland does a fantastic job getting the job done with such little cap space. And we still got to sign Bear, mind you, but we've done the job elsewhere. And we're now having Oilers writers sitting here questioning if we did enough to solve the defense issue. I'm sorry. No matter what we did this offseason, there was no magic solving the defense issue. Were you going to go out there and trade Adam Larson for a fifth round pick and try to take a run at Alex Petrangelo, which would cost you another $4 million? Okay, yeah, well, there you go, 250 You've probably not signed Tyson Berry. You're good to go, but are you, are you committing to Alex Petrangelo that long? Okay, that's a possibility, but then all of a sudden, yeah, you trade Adam Larson for a third round pick or a fifth round pick or a seventh round pick, whatever it takes to get his contract off the books and get the cap space for Petrangelo. Now you have every single Hall fanboy yelling at the Oilers because, well, you traded Hall for nothing. You traded Hall for a seventh round pick. What the heck is wrong with the Oilers? Well, right, no matter how you look at it, nobody's ever going to be 100% happy here in Oilers land. And instead of going out of the way to figure out how the Oilers are a better team from signing these guys. Mark Spector has to take the doom and gloom look at it of, oh, the Oilers are just the new Toronto Maple Leafs they can't defend in the playoffs. And that's fair. That's fair to look at. But to seriously go out there and suggest that in a 2-2 game, you should be out there defending rather than attacking. And uh, that is essentially what the first few paragraphs of this is, is simply put, Right, you, you sit there and, oh, average. we scored enough goals in the playoffs. I'll, I'll read you this for, snippet. Edmonton finished second among all playoff teams, averaging 3.75 goals scored per game, so scoring was an issue. The problem, the Oilers were dead last in having allowed four games, four goals per game. Guys, we played four games, okay? Yeah, sure, four games. And lost to a goalie, Corey Crawford, who registered a sub-900 save percentage. So we're, we're talking Corey Crawford is a goalie that played bad enough to lose. And I agree with Mark Spector there. That's 100%. Corey Crawford should have lost that series. The problem is not that the Oilers can't defend. It's that the Oilers beat themselves. The Oilers didn't play hard enough. They didn't want to commit to live up to the potential they can play with. There is no problem with the Oilers being A, a good regular season team, a dangerous, probably the most dangerous team in the NHL next season. We talked about that yesterday. That's why I wanted to get that video yesterday, is if that team that we now see in front of us going into January plays up to their potential, they are perhaps the best regular season team in the NHL this year. That makes them the most dangerous team, right? You got to look out for these guys because they are gunning for the top. It makes sense because you got the offense and realistically, no matter how you want to weigh it, the defense is no worse than it was last year. Tyson Berry for Oscar Clefbaum, in my mind, what you gain and what you lose pretty much equals out. Because based on Tyson Berry's power play prowess, yeah, the power play was pretty dang good last year, but... Oscar Clefbaum, guys, really, if you watch the film, does not add enough because by the time he's been out there and the Oilers haven't scored 45 seconds into the power play, there's a lot of shorthand goals going in because the guy's beat and not paying attention on the defensive side of the puck. So now you add Tyson Berry, who's very noted for the offensive power play, right? I don't need to rehash that for you. You get the argument there. And honestly, where's the defense weaker? Matt Benning? He's a third line guy. You've now got three right hand side guys. You don't have Oscar uh, or Oscar Clefbaum to eat all those minutes on the left hand side. How are we ever going to defend without Oscar Clefbaum? I'm sorry. The world is not going to end by losing Oscar Clefbaum. Guys, the Oilers <laughs> play about, on average, 15 to 20 games a season without Oscar Clefbaum. And yes, is it noticeable that Oscar Clefbaum isn't on the ice? Sure, but guess what else is noticeable? The Oilers have a multitude of other injuries and a lack of depth on the roster at the time Oscar Clefbaum is usually injured. So when you hash that out and you add in extra scoring, you add in extra kind of defensive prowess from the offensive side, and really, I, I don't know, it remains to be seen, but I think Tyson Berry can be a capable defender to the Oscar Clefbaum level. Oscar Clefbaum, I don't know what it is exactly, the intangibles he brings that makes him so good at what he does and why the Oilers always win with him in the lineup, 
But you look at him, half the time it looks good, half the time it looks bad. That's better than Darnell Nurse, where three quarters of the time it looks bad and only a quarter of the time it looks good. But still, if you're playing 50-50 puck with it, your best defenseman, you're not, you're not exactly gaining much out there anyway. So that is, again, mention the name Darnell Nurse. That's a guy, if he lives up to the potential... If he lives up to the potential that he has as a big, bad, physical defender who can score and make some plays, all of a sudden, yeah, you've solved your problem. This guy's making 5.6. He is your number one defenseman this year. I'm sorry, there's no other way to put it. Darnell Nurse, for what he's getting paid this year, has to be your number one defenseman, right? Physically speaking on the lineup card, when you're looking at salaries, Darnell Nurse making $5.6 million per year is far and above anybody else on the Oilers' blue line. He's got to be your number one. So what has he got to do to be your number one? Live up to the potential. Live up to the potential. And it is, again, don't beat yourself. And that's why the Oilers lost. The Oilers did not lose to Chicago. And anyone that's still sitting here talking about losing to Chicago can't realize that you can't beat Chicago if you can't beat yourself. And the Oilers... Well, they couldn't beat themselves because they were too busy beating themselves. And that's the stupid part about it. And man, I think the biggest thing that fired me up about this whole Mark Spector article and this ridiculous five, six paragraphs that it took to get to talking about Dominic Cahoon and Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl maximizing them is the fact that Mark Spector's out here thinking that Oilers land or accusing Oilers fans of just easily forgetting what happened the first week of August. I'm sorry, I was, and I will admit this, and I admitted it in the Game 1 stream. If you have not watched my Game 1 meltdown during the third period, please go back and watch it. You will see a man broken and beaten from being absolutely just off on a desert island in my own mind. I was absolutely off my rocker in August, all right? It was a hard month of July. It was a hard month of August. Game one came in, and I snapped. And I mean, talk about being absolutely off the rocker. I was completely off the rocker in game one's third period. And I'm sorry, you think I'm going to easily forget? You, you think that's easy for me to forget? That is absolutely ridiculous. I am sorry. And I, it's not that I sit here. I, I'm not a guy that goes out of my way to sit here and diss Oilers media guys all the time, but... I'm sorry, that that right there is ridiculous to accuse Oilers fans of easily forgetting what happened against the Blackhawks. Because the reason we are so excited, okay? The reason we are so excited by what has happened this offseason. The additions of Turris, the additions of Pugliarvi, Cahoon, Barry, keeping the goaltending tandem the same is because we have a chance to not have what happened last time. Yeah, you know what? We know what we have defensively. We know it's not perfect, but we know if they play to their capabilities and don't beat themselves, the only problem we have is let's go score as many goals as it takes not to lose the hockey game. And again, back to that Point Inspector's article, a 2-2 hockey game, you can't win it if you play in your own zone the whole time. So where does the difference come in? The difference comes in, you've got a third line that now features hopefully Turris and Pugliarvi, in which that adds scoring punch, unlike when you had Sheehan and Josh Archibald in there, who, yeah, you know what, they aren't noted as players of the caliber of a Turris or a Pugliarvi. I, I sure don't think Josh Archibald's a fourth overall pick in the NHL in 2016. I sure don't think that, and I sure don't think uh, Riley Sheehan has come off how many straight seasons of scoring 25-plus points like Kyle Turris has. So where in that do the Oilers not improve? And yeah, okay, nitpick the defense and the goaltending. The goaltending's iffy. I'm sorry, Miko Koskinen, not iffy. And if the defense plays in front of them like they're capable of, like we know they're capable of, like they are getting paid to be capable of, no issue at all ladies and gentlemen no issue at all so just to sit here and i mean mark specter might have wrote written that article to get this exact reaction this exact reaction i've just given you for 14 minutes and 20 seconds make me waste 15 minutes of my day on a useless article that won't matter a week from now because mark specter will have written something else to rile up oilers fans i'm sorry this is just absolutely ridiculous to sit here and have to discuss that the Oilers are somehow, in Mark Spector's term, 
no better off than they were before signing all these guys. In, in essence, for what Clefbaum and Athanasiu would cost you. Straight up. I, I guess that's the way to put it. So, just... Just ridiculous, okay? Just ridiculous. The the accusations thrown out in this article that Oilers fans just easy. Oh, it's oh e- Oilers fans have easily forgotten to 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 forget. Oh, it's easy to forget what happened in August. No, it's friggin' not easy to forget. That's why I'm so excited by what's happening now. That's why I'm still so gung ho about making sure we get this right. That's why I'm so gung-ho about what we have now, is because this solves the problems we saw in August. Yeah, three, 3.75 goals per game. What were the Colorado Avalanche averaging in the uh, round robin? What were they averaging in the series against the Arizona Coyotes? Yeah, they were averaging some pretty big goals too, and look at how far they went, right? Is You know what, playoff hockey, you got to feast or famine, and you got to feast when you can, and then the other time, yeah, get the job done. But you know, know what? The more goals, the better. Because the more you play offense, ladies and gentlemen, proven fact. Proven fact, unless you're Vesa Toscala. All right? I will prove a fact here, unless you're Vesa Toscala. Proven fact. If you play in the offensive zone more than the opponent, you have a bigger, better chance to score more goals than they do. 100%. And that's what you have to do in a 2-2 game in the third period of a playoff game. You don't just sit in your own zone for 19 minutes and hope to get lucky for a minute and score the 3-2 goal. No, you go out there and you try to score 4, 5, 6, whatever it takes in the, your score column at the end of the game to win the game, you got to score those goals. You don't sit there and in a playoff game sit there and defend for 18, 19 minutes of the period and say, oh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go get one late. And it'll all be over. What kind of backwards logic is that? Nah, my goodness. Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tyson. This is Stalling the TV. I've wasted enough time on this nonsense. I am up on out of here.